Reclaim your confidence with STL Medical Weight Loss. Are you tired of endless dieting and minimal results at the gym? STL Medical Weight Loss offers a revolutionary program. With their highly effective injectable peptides, these medications have been approved by the FDA for weight loss, and you can lose 20 to 30 pounds in 90 days. Their telemedicine service delivers the medication right to your door, so you have privacy and convenience. Obesity rates are climbing in America. One in two Americans suffers from this problem. So call STL Medical Weight Loss at 636-628-6604 to book your consultation. And mention Tanya and you will get $200 off your first two months. That's 636-628-6604 to book your first consultation. Mention my name, Tanya, and you will get $200 off your first two months. The website is stlmedweightloss.com. Hi everybody, this is Tanya Walker and One Day to Love, and I'm welcoming you to this show today to meet Martha Byrne. You probably know her from As the World Turns and zillions of other things that she's done. She's a marvelous singer. She's an Emmy, three-time Emmy winning, winning, Emmy winning, Emmy winning, Emmy winning, say that three times fast, actress. And uh, she's producing, she's directing, she's writing, and she's fighting for her family. And we're going to talk about that today. Welcome, Martha. So happy to see Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you too. We've known each other a very long time. Very long time. We, we don't need to say years though. No, 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 no. Always no. annoying. <laughs> I have a sign in my kitchen that says, I just hate it when I run into people that say that they graduated from high school at the same eight, same year as me. And they just look so much older than I do. <laughs> you think, do I look like that? <laughs> you say, I do. Oh, look like I that. know. But we yeah. saw it's all what's inside your, it's all what's inside your, if you feel it's what you feel, right? It's your it's your body and your whole mindset and all of this. Sometimes I feel very old. I have to be. Mm. Sometimes I'm. I sitting, don't blame you. I'm sitting on the sofa and I'm like, you know what? I've been sitting here all day, you know. And then there's other <laughs> times I go climb every mountain. You know, it just right. It's, it's not it's not steady like it used to be. No, no, and you have to listen to your body too because your body needs rest at times, and and it's hard to. So <laughs> these days, your body just. T- shuts off it says, this is it. We're, not, we're not we're not doing that today yeah today we're not we're nah. taking a break no nah. no that's not happening mm-hmm. I try I that. try but it's not my mind wants to do one thing and my body wants to do another uh so we're very lucky we're still here <laughs> yes agreed I agree I look at it so yeah. anyhow um you're beautiful you're doing you. a tele- you. Are you doing a, a, a new media kind of show? Or are you producing something like that? I'm always got projects and percolating, you know, and um, before the pandemic happened, I mean, Laura Lee Bell and I have been, we have several projects who, you know, That's on the restless. Yeah. We have a few projects that we've created together that we've been working to sell for quite a while, but the pandemic really put a wrench in a lot of things in that development process, but we're, we're still doing that. And, I produced a movie for a Hallmark Channel um, before the pandemic happened. Actually, during it was like right when it was happening. So, and you know, I'm constantly writing. I've I've really embraced writing more during COVID. The last, yeah, just in general, I found it to be very cathartic. Me too. And I have you know when you have something to say and you, you want to see if people will, will bite on are interested. And I've found that to be. I've been writing on this platform called Medium. I mm-hmm. love it. It's very short format, you know, little stories. It's for writers. I'm trying to get better at writing um, to, you know, with what, what's going on in my personal life to kind of express what's happening in a way that people can digest it, but also feel that they're experiencing it. And I think what's interesting about that is that with our experience in the industry, you'd be surprised how embedded it is in your DNA, storytelling writing, creativity, yeah, emotional expression. Uh, you know, I would never thought that 40 years of being in, in the entertainment business that I would actually be able to write about Chinese espionage and 
uh, all that other stuff that's kind of come into it's my going world. Going on the in the world, years. isn't that nice? Yeah, yes, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, it hits hit home. I'm writing an international thriller that's sort of loosely based on my family. So, um, wow. And I've been working on it for four years with my partner in Quebec. Good. We Good. Keep took, it up. I, I had to take four or five months off um, at, at Thanksgiving because I was in the house writing from one o'clock to five o'clock every day. So I'm in the house writing and he's in Quebec. So the time difference. Mm. Is well, anyway, let's get back to you. Um, so I just want everybody to know that Martha has been like a very unusual uh, white knight in daytime television. She's been a really good human being. There's not one scandal, not one person has one bad thing to say about. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. It's true. You're very highly respected with all of your peers and everybody you've worked with and everything else. Um, and I just found out from you a while back that the government was giving you a hard time. It was actually mm -hmm. giving your husband a hard time. Yeah. And, uh, and I saw you on the news several times and I'm like what the heck is going on so mm -hmm. you explained it to me then why don't you explain it to everybody just in case they don't know so my husband's a retired NYPD sergeant detective he got 75 medals of honor during his time at the NYPD he was a school safety sergeant in charge of 40 public and private schools in the Bronx he was in heavy combat many times many shootings and he was he was a really prolific cop in the sense that he helped probably God knows how many people save, save their lives. Like he was in a police shooting in Times Square on New Year's Eve where mm -hmm. he stopped a full blown Wild West machine gun shootout in Times Square in on New Year's Eve. When we first started dating, we weren't even married yet, I think, when that happened. Uh, so this was the kind of his day to day. He wasn't the guy that sat behind a desk and pushed papers. He was he was very active and he got in a very bad car accident on the job during a police chase. The man who ran him off the road had beaten his girlfriend up so badly. He had broken both of her eye sockets. He had been stalking her and harassing her and drove by her house saying he was going to kill a cop if she had called the cops. So needless to say, she called the cops, the police chase uh, happened and my husband was ran off the road and hit a telephone pole at 50 miles an hour, breaking his hip, part of his neck, ended his career completely devastated him because he loved what he did, but he could no longer climb fences. He was, you know, it was really devastating to him because he loved it. So he became a private investigator and really used those skills to become one of the most sought after private investigators in the tri-state area, working on federal cases, high profile clients. Like he wasn't a cheating spouse chaser. Like again, big cases, homicides, you name it, he worked on it. And he got a call in 2016, a routine call from a U.S. business in Queens looking for a licensed PI in New Jersey to run some asset searches, do some surveillance, very routine, was paid by a bank check, U.S. bank check from that company, met his client um, in at a Panera Bread, took some notes, met at a lawyer's office he was working out of, had took some notes, hired two NYPD retired guys he had worked with as PIs to do some work with him on the case spoke to two federal agents about the case, kind of like in passing. One he did was his job. Uh, um, he did his job. He was doing his job. This was done. This is 2016. Uh, notified the local police every time he was doing surveillance. So there was a record, obviously, you know, he always did that. And then he never thought about it. He went on with his life and we went on with our lives. And then four years later, the FBI comes to our door during a during before dawn and arrests him in front of my kids for failing to register as a foreign agent. It's called the FARA, Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, you've been hearing about it probably a little bit on the news now with Hunter Biden and, and a lot of other politicians. Um, it's really based on lobbying. It's not a, um, a crime necessarily. It's a it's an administrative issue. You're supposed to register if you're working for a foreign government. Um, but he wasn't working. My husband wasn't working for a foreign government. He was working right. for a New York-based client. And interstate stalking. And, you know, you get that, that happens and you, you go, what is going on? Right. This is, this is crazy. First of all, why do they always come, why do they always come at the crack of dawn? Cause they want to surprise, they want to make an impact. You know, 
they, that's part of their MO. They, they, you know, I, I find this to be completely offensive that with my husband's background, he's worked for the federal government on cases. He's been an investigator on federal, several federal cases. They know, they, listen, at this point, they've looked, they know your children's DNA. They know your, their blood type. They know everything about you, right? They know that he's not a criminal. They know he would never do anything wrong. He's never done anything wrong. They should have called him to come in and talk to him. You know, they didn't have to come in the morning and scare my kids. That was a choice. And I find as I've gone through this for three and a half years now, I find that, you know, I have the visual in my head of like all these FBI agents sitting around a table in, in Red Bank, New Jersey going, you know, let's go, let's go in the morning when his kids are home and let's really make a scene. You know, I find that to be the most, probably the most offensive thing. They've done a lot of offensive things, but to me that, that takes That's the cake. Terrible. Uh, it's, terrible. it's terrible. It's unnecessary. It's traumatic. It's causing trauma. Oh, on I children. had it it's, happen. I had it happen. Yeah, with, you know, I, I had a nanny who, who was from, uh, Bosnia and um and she couldn't speak English and we weren't planning on keeping her so we we didn't we found another place for her to go and, and she she went to be with a family that spoke her language in Washington DC and uh mm. so Ed and I are sleeping in Easton or Ridgefield we lived in Ridgefield Connecticut and I heard this metal banging on the window in the front foyer and it was about 5 30 a.m and it was like a banging with a metal thing you know and it turned mm -hmm. out it was their badges and there were four of them. So I had my nightgown on. So I went and peeked around the corner and I said, Ed, you got to come here. And there's these four guys I could see through the window and the door standing out there with their badges up against the window, like all four of them. And, uh, and when I went over there and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> Can I help you? Um, they showed me a picture of her and, uh, asked me if I knew where she was. And I said, no, I don't know where she is. She hasn't been here in a long time. Well, do you know that she's a this and that and the other thing and that we're looking for her and she's overstayed her visa and she's in the country illegally and da 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 da, -da. And um, she wasn't in the country illegally initially, but she stayed too long. And she mm -hmm. ran off with a guy that's, that's uh, uh, was, they thought he might be a bad guy. So um, they were following him also. And I said, well, I don't know where she went. I gave her to this family and you can call the agency and they would know where she is. But why did they have to do that to us and our family at the crack of dawn? It didn't even have anything to do with me. She didn't think I was harboring a fugitive. I mean, they, well, they would have said that, they should, right? I mean, that, that, your, right. they should look at your record and what you've done in your life. You know, I've supported that, Cuomo. I've supported um uh, Lee Fisher. I've, I, I gave money to Clinton. I gave money to everybody. I've given money to every, every, both sides of every aisle. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been a really big supporter of whoever I think is the best for the country. We've been very big in charities and we're not harboring fugitives and they could at least call me. Like you said, they could just call and he's been yeah. in law enforcement perfectly. He's had a perfect record in law enforcement. Yep. And worked with the feds on several cases That's before. Several so cases. it's not like, so like to, to do that. And, you know, he was all amped up the agent that was here and he was, he, he said a lot of things about why, you know, that he knew my husband from another case and that he was, you know, he, it was just, it was so gross. Sorry. It was gross. And did they my take husband was, that morning? Mm -hmm. But they didn't, they didn't handcuff him. They never took his computers, his phones, his, his guns they didn't go to his home office it was really weird the whole thing was weird they never handcuffed him until he was outside by the by the car well, that was 2016 um, so then what happened well the 2016 he was arrested in 2020 so oh wow. so Octo yeah four years later after 2016 that's a long time later yeah it is and you know over those four year investigation they never spoke to any of the U.S. law enforcement connected to this case. There were three retired NYPD detectives, my husband and two others, one, two federal agents active that my husband had spoken to about this case in 2016, 17. And the FBI never spoke to any of them for four year, their four year investigation, never. And but they did speak to the Chinese agents who were admitted criminals for years and let them come and go out of the country. Uh, there was a whole they they chose the wrong side you know to work with and then I don't you know I guess there's an issue with that from several people that I've you know over the last couple of years I've become pretty knowledgeable about procedure and 
you know, the former ne- director of national intelligence, Richard Grinnell, he's been, sp- he's spoken about this on TV, you know, and he spoke, I saw him in DC and I've heard him say this many times is that, you know, you have an obligation. Our government has an obligation to notify someone if they've been targeted by a nefarious foreign actor, we, we, to protect the family, to protect my family, to protect, you know, maybe get information, you know, the fact that they never came to my husband, if this, if these people were technically as bad as they claim that they are, you know, the head of the FBI said they were acting like an organized crime syndicate. If that's the truth, how can you leave my family vulnerable to these people? How can you not come and warn us and protect us? How can you not talk to the two active federal agents interconnected who have security clearance, right? They could have talked to them and said, one of your friends has been targeted. You know, we need to look into this further. They didn't do that. Um, they kind of went backwards into the whole case. And, you know, you know, you've been spied on, you know, every everything about you has been exposed to people. Strangers are looking at your, everything about you, every, every, anything you can imagine they've, they've looked at, right? So this and is your family it, that they've been investigating. Yeah, basically. I mean, they're, they're not the Chinese husband. guy he was working for. No, that was no. I mean, they, they, that guy fled the country. They all, all the bad guys in this case, the, the real big top guys fled the country on the FBI's watch. They let it happen. They were here. They could have, they could have gotten them. They didn't. So this is like, they call this like low hanging fruit, right? These are people that are unwitting participants in something and they're easy to get because they're unaware that they've been targeted. Okay. So, you know, the, the whole I my, no one ever knew what FARA was F A R A it, it was a it was until a, Hunter Biden got it got accused of it right and it and it's an administrative task meaning you go online you fill out paperwork I, th- I think it's free to say you're working for on behalf of a foreign government for a lobbying in D C it's always about lobbyists it's about influence it's political influence sometimes lawyers have to register if they're working for a client who's from another country. It has never been used for a private investigator. It's never been ever. But what happened was in 2018, something called the China Initiative happened. It was brought under the Trump administration where they wanted to amp up investigations on China. Rightfully so, right? Rightfully so for IP. Um, This case is not, should never have been brought under the China Initiative because my husband was doing things in the line of work. He was not lobbying. He was not, there was no, no trade secrets, no national security issues. There was no, no nobody got hurt. Um, you know, the subject of his surveillance had been wanted for crimes in China. Uh, he was, uh, you know, accused of la- laundering money. He was sued here on a civil matter. I mean, this is not somebody that was, you know, fleeing for political purposes from China. This was a different circumstance. Uh, so there, a lot about it, things about it that should never have happened. And so when the China initiative came into the, to the top of the pile, this case got heat. It started getting some action, but there was no crime that had been committed. My husband didn't commit any crime. Um, the subject never saw him that he was following. He couldn't identify him in court. There's no police report saying he was followed. There's no restraining order. There's, not, there's no evidence ev- anywhere that exists anywhere that my husband had anything to do with putting anyone in any uh, danger, okay? So to charge him with stalking is ridiculous because he was parked on a public street. He never would harass anybody. He would never bother anybody. He was, he's never broken the law. So, you know, we said, we're going to fight it. You know, we were going to fight this because the evidence was so obvious that he was innocent. So once the government finds out that you're fighting it, then they really get, uh, it gets intense, meaning they start coming up with a, a story, you know, a, a, a manufactured story to present to the jury. Now my dog's going to bark now. Let's see, sorry. Hi, doggy. You may do that. You may. Let me see. Um, oh, I heard it. So, so you know, you get when you when you when you go up against the federal government, they send you discovery. Now, it's a national security case which is crazy to me because my husband, again, left the country during his invest- when they were investigating him. He's working on other federal cases. All of a sudden, he's like a bad guy, but he's been approved to work for federal 
cases. It doesn't make any sense, right? No, so we knew we knew we knew there wasn't going to be any evidence of his guilt in there unless someone lied and said, "Oh yeah, Mr. McMahon knew what was going on." Um, quite the opposite. It's you know everything we've seen exonerates him. I, I you know of course. Um, the evidence is overwhelming of his innocence, but the government went to such great lengths, late lengths to suppress exculpatory evidence against him, which is shocking to me. If you know someone's innocent, you've seen the same evidence I have, but you go to so far to pr suppress it so that you can win is the antithesis of what our justice system is supposed to be. I mean, we we were not allowed to talk about his career at trial. We were not allowed to talk about the civil lawsuit against the subject of his surveillance. We were not allowed to bring that up at trial. We were not allowed to show his interrogation. It was two hours where he was clearly innocent. And he talked about that it was a civil matter. It was a civil matter. It was a civil matter. They wouldn't let us put that in. The jurors were sleeping often. Um, the prosecutors literally made up a story and just, and just literally lied to the jury. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I really, I literally could not believe what I was hearing, what I was seeing. And he was found guilty, not guilty of conspiring to commit FARA. So they couldn't prove that he was working with the, the government of China because the evidence was so obvious that he was hired by an American company. He was recommended by an American lawyer for this case. He did all his due diligence. There was nothing about this case that was outside the routine of a normal PI case. So he was found not guilty of conspiring with the foreign government to violate FARA, but he was found guilty of violating FARA, which makes no sense. And he was found guilty of interstate stalking. This is, this didn't, don't and he never let investigators them. watch people. That's their job. It's also the they job call of that stalking. Well, this is what's so scary about this case is that if this verdict sticks, Parking on a public street can now be a federal crime. So if you're a news organization who does, they park on the street all the time. I mean, when my husband- Investigative when reporting. Home, all the time. When we when he came back from his interrogation, we had news, news cameras outside our house. They were pointing lights in the front windows. They followed me. They took pictures of my kids. They had a drone over our house. I'm sorry. You know, I'm so sorry. Well, but, but my point is, is that that's not They're illegal. They're stopping. <laughs> that's not but that's but that I, I can now charge them with interstate stalking if you I drove know. from new york to new jersey, new jersey. to sit in my house to, to to film us and also insurance companies use pis for fraud to make sure people aren't all the time you know all the time all the time um, yeah. so it's a very slippery slope that they that they have gone down here and the pi business is an eight billion dollar a year business you know lawyers rely on pis for it to do I just, I'm just amazed that the things that they go after and the things that they don't. Mm. We, we have we have illegal people in the country killing other people, making yeah. first they they rob and they don't get put away, and then they they do something else, and then they attack somebody and they beat up a cop and blah 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 blah, and they burn don't. a building down, yeah, and, burn then, and then they yeah, shoot yeah. somebody or you know hit this beautiful girl over the head in Georgia and kill yeah. her. And they're worried about them being called the right politically correct word. I mean, we're, just, we're in a very, very, we're in a very scary yeah. situation in our country right now. And here's, here's what's so bizarre to me is that I sat in a trial for three weeks and the press would come in and out. You know, they would pop in for a minute and they'd leave. And, and I'm looking at the evidence that's coming up in this trial going, how is this not being reported? We had Chinese police officers running amok through our country under their real names, saying who they are, what their titles were for the CCP, right on the screen. I'm looking at it going, how is this not being reported that our government knew they were here? The FBI knew they were here. They knew who they were. But you're going to get well, after my husband who takes a client who happens to be Chinese and, and he's supposed to assume that it's the Chinese government. That's racist. That's racist. That's racial profiling. He does not do that. He took a client who would, he doesn't judge people. It was this guy had lost millions of dollars, allegedly, which he had a millions of dollars had been stolen from a construction company. So how how how? how 
but so so we do this trial right and they're saying how these people come and they harass people and that does happen i mean at, at the ccp will send people here to harass dissidents and we've seen it on the news this is not that case okay this this is not in that lane let's just be very clear so this trial happens and you know we're going about our business and and a few weeks ago anthony blinken has a meeting in dc with the head of these fox hunt repatriation operations in dc sitting across having dinner with him and i got furious i said so wait a minute in in our case you're saying that this man is responsible for all these horrible things you know he's you know terrible things are going on in our country because the, at the direction of this man but he flies in he goes to the un he meets with anthony blinken and he goes to this to san francisco and then everybody's happy i'm going you guys are not the message isn't getting getting out there and whether it's purposeful or not is yet to be seen but you go after my husband and use my husband as a as a as the poster child for for bad CCP behavior. Are you kidding me? And what I mean, did, what was the guy that they went that, that Blinken had a conversation with or met? His with? name is Lee, Lee Lee. I have I can't pronounce his last but what name. But he do? And, and and what did he so do? So he was the head. He, he was the head of the um, office of disciplinary. They have has a long long name, yeah. but it says he is in charge of the fox hunt operations and. When he came here, he he was he was interviewed by the press, and he said, "Oh yeah, we 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 talk to the DOJ all the time about sending people back, and you know we we host them, and so you're sending mixed messages to." to and what does the, your husband our, have to do with this 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 situation? Not at all. Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. But he he is the only American that was charged. Okay, he is he is the only U.S. citizen that was charged in this case. He is a hero and he really looks good in, in, in the clickbait, doesn't he? Yeah. They didn't use, they didn't put anybody else's. It was all about Mike, Mike because his, his history, it was, it was an optics case to show that, oh, we'll go after Americans too. And look, not just an American, this American, right? And that is horrifying that they, listen, there's been PIs, there's other cases similar to this that were never charged, okay? Because they were, they were all of them were unwitting participants in something. There's a case of an Iranian journalist who a PI followed her for three months, three months, and the FBI went to him and said, "Do you realize that you're being used by the Iranian government?" And he went, "Oh my gosh, I had no idea." Well, what did the FBI do with him? They used him, brought him on their team, and they brought the case down within a year, and that woman's life was saved. Why don't we? Why didn't Mike get the same courtesy? To I'm bring me brought on the team. No, it doesn't make any sense. And no, thing, it doesn't make any sense. He was going after somebody who had been swindled out of millions and millions of dollars for for a company. This is not unusual. Yeah. People get swindled no. out of money, especially in the construction business, all the time. I mean, that's right. And so you want to see, you want to see where. So they wanted to know how many houses does he own, how many cars does he own, how many LLCs does he have? Exactly. He, his that's daughter, not a his, that's not a Chinese government versus U.S. government situation at all. So so I be. so I don't know why why they would bring in that element because it's not that it's not that. Well, the it's, big thing. Well, one of the big things is they said, well, why are you looking up the family members' uh, addresses and their you know locations and their college? Like, if you've had millions of dollars stolen from you, okay, you want to know where the money's being spent. That's if right. a person goes to a very expensive college, well, who's paying for that college? That's who's right. buying? If there's an apartment building in California, that's what they've been doing all... in the in the Congress with Biden and the money that supposedly came through Hunter from China. Where'd the money go? What people got it? Of you know? course, that's, that's how what, you. That's, that's called you follow do. the money. That's, that's follow the money. Yeah. And he uncovered some. He uncovered money laundering in this case, and he provided the information to his client. And a few months later that subject was served on his property in a civil lawsuit. And our, our, the prosecutors are claiming that my husband provided un, an unknown address. That's nonsense. It was public information. It's, it, you could find it so easily to, to claim that my husband's responsible for everything that happens at that address from now until the end of time is, is ludicrous. It's like, if, I, I kind of say like, you, you have a meeting with a client, right? You're, let's say you met, like you met with a Panera Bread. And your client gets up and robs that person that you're talking about. 
right? Let's say they rob that person. Is he responsible not for, at the, all. The, for the crimes of other people? Well, that's not what yes. happened here. They're trying to pin every, every bad thing that happened to these people on my husband. And here's the other thing. If they came to him in April of 2017, which is when they had his phone number and they had the other people involved that were U.S. law enforcement, if they went to him in April of 2017 and said, hey, man, you were used and targeted, he would be like, oh, my gosh, let me help you, right? A, anything that happened after that, any crimes, harassment of these people is on the watch of the FBI. Because if they had come to my husband, he would have been helpful and that he would have stopped the pattern of, of, of harassment if there was one, because he would have been able to help them. So if the people, the targets are upset, they should be upset with the FBI because the FBI allowed them to be harassed. Do you understand? Yeah. If, 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 if all of a sudden you're saying you're, you're, you can't identify Mike, there's no police reports from 2017 of any following harassment, you know, what really makes me so upset is that in our country, there are women who are beaten, harassed, stalked, followed, file police reports, go to court, protective orders, and they still get attacked because our, we haven't protected them enough. And you're going to tell me that my husband stalked someone who has who never filed a police report, never called the local police, didn't know who he was. Has, there's no pattern of any kind of anything that he's done and a he gets a federal charge of interstate stalking because someone texted him from another state that was his client who said something. I mean, this is this should scare the living crap out of anybody that's listening to this. Well, that's, the, that, thing, that's the thing that's that that I just want people to be aware of. If they decide to come after you, because this happened with us. Yep. Um, my husband had a very successful uh, company that was a relocation company. And he had been um, dealing with real estate and creating new entrepreneurial position, you know, corporations to help people with their real estate, with their houses. When they move, he had the largest privately held relocation company in the country. Um, and he didn't start there. He started small. He, he's, you know, he was a lawyer, but he started down here and he built this thing really big and he knew all the banks and he knew all the, all the situations that were going on. Um, especially when the, he, we, he had, he'd started something called home pool years and years ago where he would, um, he would take houses of people that people that had homes that they didn't really want to, to sell through a realtor and they had to move to Detroit because their whole company was moving to Detroit, for instance. And he knew they were moving to Detroit and there was a company from Detroit that was moving to wherever these people lived. He would give them the chance to look at one another's homes so they could make deals privately that way. And it really helped people out a lot and save people a lot of money. Um, and then he also continued with more and more and more of this relocation. So he ended up with like all the big companies. He he moved the Chevron people and the Pepsi people and the these people and that people and took care of everything about the move, right? Um, so he decided to sell that company and keep the um, appraisal management company. So I remember being at the Masters and having um, a person from, from a bank uh, say to him, we don't have to do real appraisals of property because we can sell, if, if somebody's willing to spend 750 on a $500,000 house, I will, we'll, we'll give them the loan for that because my boss doesn't care and they're giving me 10 cents on the dollar for the loan. So it's, you know, it's, it's no big deal. We don't need to use your appraisal company that does really proper appraisals. We can drive by the house. If somebody's willing to pay, it's, it's fine. So Ed said, well, we're going to have a huge crash in this country, a huge crash. And so then he came up with, uh, another company he was so brilliant, um, that, that would make the bank make a deal with people. Um, and so he, he knew that the banks had broken the law by not doing proper appraisals. So if Jane's going to get thrown out of her house because she can't afford this huge payment on a house that isn't worth it, he called Jane's bank and he would say, hey, 
I know that you didn't do a proper appraisal on this house and I'm an attorney and I'll bring a class action lawsuit against you and all of your people and all of your banks. If you don't come up with a number that, that Jane can afford to pay, that'll pay her loan back in time, maybe a little longer. What's the number? And, and he, it, he always were, it always, almost always worked. He was 99% successful. So the government calls him and says, you better be 99% successful. You're advertising that you are. And if you're not, we're going to shut you down. He goes, please come, come to my Florida office, come to my Ohio office. And, and you'll see that, that I have, we have a way of doing this. That's, that's very proper and very successful and really helps a lot of people. They show up with guns and shut his business down in Florida and shut his business down in Ohio. And, um, assign what they call a receiver, a person that knows nothing about the business. It's basically there to just cut it, cut it up in little pieces and, and ruin it, you know? And, um, I felt just like you, I was like, well, you know, if I explained to the judge, you know, that, that, He's been trying to help people since the day he was born, okay? Mm -hmm. So he does this to help people. He does that to help people. And these people, there were five people that signed a contract that said, we will, we will if you decide to keep our case, is what he had written on the contract. If we take your case and we can save your house, you have to take your house. You can't say, oh, well, you spent $1,500 on your staff to save my house, but I don't want my house, so back with it. So if you, if we decide we're going to, if you want to work with us and we can save your house, you, we keep the $1,500. Now there mm -hmm. were other people at the time, many, 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 many crooks who were taking money and not helping people. Right. So they just, I'm sure. so they just lumped him in with all these people, but he had proof after proof after proof. As a matter of fact, the man who was with the SEC, and I'm not going to say his name in Ohio said to Ed, I know that you're innocent. I know you didn't do anything wrong. And as a matter of fact, they just really need to get you. They just, Washington mm. really wants to get you. So if you could just, if you don't mind saving my sister's house, I'd mm. really appreciate it. So during this time, my husband saved this man's sister's house in Ohio. Surprised I didn't ask you for an autograph to headshot. <laughs> it goes on and on, but anyhow. Um, but your point is, you see, you're, you're what, what you said is very important. And I, I before we got on, I was telling you about a Supreme Court case, and it was uh, Joe Prococo who's had his case overturned in uh, his his verdict overturned, his conviction overturned by the Supreme Court last year. And in the brief, in the summary, I think it was Judge Alito. Don't for, forgive me if it, it's not said. A person should not learn about a crime or a law the day the FBI shows up at their house, okay? Meaning, to your point about your husband, okay? There should be no reason that they went after him based on a non-existing crime because this was a new venture. This was a new, the times of the, the housing market going bananas and crashing, your husband came up with a solution that they made out to look like a crime because it was hurting the government, probably. And that's why well, the they figured- couldn't do it. They had said that they could do this and they weren't being very successful. So they went after someone who was. Well, there you go. But it, they, it benefits the government more if they can take the houses than actually have someone stay in the houses, right? I mean, that's that, that's government, government civil forfeiture, right? You're gonna go, if okay. they they- but but your husband, how can you charge somebody with something that doesn't exist in his mind? Meaning you can't, he doesn't know he's breaking a law that doesn't, it doesn't exist yet is what, what happened to your husband. A law. He wasn't breaking a law. Right. Everything he was supposed to do. But these, but the judge ruled that they didn't know what they were signing, even though it was in great big black marker. Um, so they created that, meaning that they created this, this kind of charge so to speak, because they had to for their own purposes. It had nothing to do with, like my husband also didn't break any law. There's no law that was broken, none, zero, like nothing. So what did they do? They made it look like it was nefarious 
by their way they presented the case to the to the jury same thing, about same thing, same thing. okay so if you say if they say well he took he took cash at a panera bread you go okay but he also has an invoice for all the cash he met with them and you know he they must have talked about x y and z it's like but there's no evidence to what you're claiming to be true so if there's no evidence to back up your claims here's what here's what i find to be really disturbing is that a lot of times prosecutors will say well it's argument we're allowed to do argument at a trial you know what could have happened you know but here's my problem with that if you know that that's if you've seen evidence to the contrary there should be no they should not be allowed to argue it if you know what you're stating is false but you're putting it forward to a jury because you want to win that should be illegal. You, you, if you know for a fact that Mike McMahon was not at that location, which was proven at court, but you continue to claim that he was at that location and and lie, that whole thing should be thrown out. I mean, we were sitting there on day one, they put a picture up on the screen claiming it to be a day that it wasn't. And Mike's like, wait a minute, that, I, that picture is from six months prior to what they're claiming it was and they're telling the jury that it happened on another day and it's a lie so and if you opened up the picture there was a pin of the location that the government cropped so they cr they cropped a lot of stuff to make it look different than it was so that's that's wrong you know well, wait, these people there were five people who uh claimed that they wanted their fifteen hundred dollars back and uh they didn't tell him they told the uh, government and that's why the government went after him because they decided they didn't want their house so all together these five houses came to 1.7 million dollars so they came after us for that money and i said we're fighting this we didn't do anything mm -hmm. wrong we're fighting this mm -hmm. we and i called these various politicians and i mean there's a lot of them because i'm very very much involved in 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 the, i'm very patriotic that's all i can tell you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i've given a lot to people that i thought would be helpful to the country and um helpful to people in ohio and now i don't have it to give but i did at the time so did ed so we called these friends of ours that we'd given money to and just said you know do you know what would you do if you were in this position what would you do mm. this is crap this is just crap and they said, if a federal judge says that you have to settle, you should settle. I said, but we didn't yeah. do anything wrong. Why do we have to settle? It's not settling. It's giving up. Yeah. That you don't want, you don't want, you don't want to go down this road, Tanya. You don't want to. to do you know how many people, do you know many people tell my husband to take a plea deal? They said, mm -hmm. just take the plea deal. You're going to lose everything. You know, they, 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 they prosecutors win 99% of their cases. That's what we because, did. Because they, we knew that. They, they will make stuff up. And they're the yeah. United States government. They're the most powerful government in the world. And they right. will make stuff up. And we've seen a lot of that in the past few years. So I mean, oh, yeah. it, it's, it's not, it's not a surprise. I just was an idiot thinking that if I got to the court, and I could talk to the judge and I could tell him what really happened and, and tell him about this conversation that we had with this big time banker down at the masters and tell him about these different people mm -hmm. that have been so grateful to my husband and the letters we've gotten about they've been able to save their home. And oh my God, right. you know, I could just tell him why he came up with this brilliant idea. Yes, he's brilliant, but it didn't just come. He didn't just pull it out of his, you know what he, he yeah. had done all these other businesses that made this look possible. And it was possible if I could just talk to him. And the lawyer said, he doesn't want to hear anything you have to say. And I said, but aren't, aren't no. I supposed to have a day in court? No, you're not. You're, you don't, this is your day in court and you don't get to say anything. Um, yeah. And they it's had very picture, frustrating. And they had a picture of my. I was having a garage sale, trying to sell my estate sale, trying to save my home, um, because they cut off all of our income. And uh, and I had a picture of a Steinway that I had at a on a silly little site about a about a um, I don't know about this big screen. Um, Weebly it was a Weebly site about my estate sale. And when we got to the federal court, all the people sitting at these big long tables, like you see in Law and Order, had a picture of my Steinway on a screen in front of them. Like they don't have anything better to do than look at my estate sale. But they said it was wrong for me to be selling stuff. 
Why? Because, 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 because I owed them so much millions of dollars. I owed them money and I didn't owe them squat. Right. It's, it was really, it is very it's really frustrating. Scary. It's very, very frustrating. Scary. It's scary. And scary. But see, like in our case, here's the thing. As Mike said, I'm never going to stand in front of a judge and, and perjure myself and say, I did something I didn't do. And I said, no, you're not. You will never do that because you can't live with yourself if you do that. That goes against everything that you've portrayed your life and in your life and what you've done in your life, which is since the age of 16, when he took the NYPD test is he's been honest. He's been him. He has got, given his life for other people to, I mean, he really has for our strangers and raised our children to fight for what's right and tell the truth at all costs. If that's, is that, if that's the, the sword that you die on, so be it because they've done a horrible thing here and knowingly uh, went after a hero who they couldn't find one thing in his life that he had done wrong. They dug mm -hmm. into his past, into the NYPD. They came up with one thing, some civilian complaint from 1995, and the prosecutors waving it on and around. And Mike's like, "I let me look at that, right? He goes, I remember this case. This is a guy who was trying to recruit kids outside one of the schools that I was in charge of to be in a gang. And he complained about me. That's the only thing they could find about my husband's career and his in his life, his they went through you know they go through everything. They go through your credit cards, your checking accounts, your photographs, your emails. Your they they know everything about you, right? Your medical, the, you know, if you take an aspirin, they know it, right? They couldn't find anything about his 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 in his background that was negative. So Not one text where message. Are we, where are we now? I'm running out of time. Where are we now? So unfortunately, you know, we filed a 4, 140 page motion to overturn the verdict, and she denied us the judge which is heartbreaking, um, did not refer reference any of our case law in her response. She just believed what the prosecutors were, were saying. Um, she claims that, that the people were put in fear due to my husband's actions. Meanwhile, they couldn't identify him. There's no police report. There's no photographs. There's, no, there's nothing that said that anything he's, he did put them in, in any fear uh, at all. Um, that's her, that's the version of the story that's that's in there out in the public and this is um, the people that he was surveilling for the chinese guy yeah yes so the, the the alleged victims in this case um you know never they couldn't even point him out at at court so i don't know how you could charge him with anything Any to do with harassment no. making or making them somebody put a, a threatening note on the door 18 months after mike's surveillance they charged my husband with that this is a public, how, I don't understand, that, I, I, I don't understand, they said, well, because the address, well, the address was public. It was public before he did surveillance. It was public after he did surveillance. So anybody could have done that. Anybody could have found the address if they wanted to. Anyway, so now we have to, you know, we're going to appeal, obviously, but in the meantime, we have to, you know, write letters of support to to keep him home. You know, it's really it's it's heartbreaking what what's happened here, and I don't know why the bleeding has to continue and why some why we have to keep going through this. Um, um, the good news is that you know my kids are great. My son just became a police officer, which is incredibly oh, yeah. So I'm really proud of him, and my other son is doing great, and my daughter's going to graduate high school, and you know we've we've managed as a family unit to to get through this and. I think I've taught them that to be strong and not be afraid, you know, you, you're, you're dealing with the most people with a lot of power and a lot of money behind them and, and no regard for your humanity. So you got to know that going into it, right? You got to go know that, that you're fighting against that. Is and, it a financial, um, is it a financial penalty or is it some other? We penalty? don't know yet. No, no, it's not. No, it's something. I mean, it's, he's looking at time, you know, potentially. So, I can't believe I'm even saying that out loud because he should never have, this should never have happened in the first place. And I don't know who's going to stop this pain. You know, they've, they've instilled in my family. Um, we need to keep them home. Uh, that to me is paramount right now. 
He's done nothing wrong. He committed no crime. And I'm tired of them using his face as, as their poster child for their lack of protecting our country on a national security level. Because they made their mistakes and let these people flee the country, that's not my problem. That's not our fault. That's on you them. You need a fall guy, and that's what you've got here. Yeah, well, it's, enough is enough because it didn't work. And our country and people are still getting harassed. And, you know, we know how to fix that. You know, we no one's ever talked. I was the one talking. I went out and talked to local police. I, I was talking to private investigators. I've been on all over the news, to, you know, trying to warn people what to look out for. FBI never did that. They never shared information with the local police or private investigative people. They 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 just they totally ignored the, the elephant in the room, which is after 9-11, we learn, we share intel. We have to share intel to protect the, the safety of our citizens. And they didn't do that here. And a lot of people got hurt. Luckily, nothing happened to my family. They, they, nothing. Luckily, nothing happened to my, my family because we'd be having a much different conversation right now if that were the case. But didn't say they weren't by my house. Didn't say, doesn't mean they weren't driving by my home. They Who knows? Who knows? And maybe someday we'll find out because someone needs to open an investigation into this case to find out who who was really put in danger and who allowed it. The problem is that it's it's almost impossible for the government to investigate the government. Unless yeah, you have, but, you know, there's, there's unless ways. You have a, if you have a DOJ that actually is is separate, which they're supposed to be separate. They're supposed to be. Yeah. And, but there's and, remember, there's a, there's there's ways. Well, there's but ways. right now they're yeah. not separate. They're not separate. No, and the FBI shouldn't and be. And I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on. There are people yeah. that are being treated really, really unfairly. And there's people oh, that absolutely. Should, be, should be arrested and they're not even being looked at. I mean, there's, there's no, I agree. we know that things have happened and we know they've done things wrong and they're, 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 they're not looking at them. And they're looking at people no. that didn't do anything wrong and, and was, were in within their rights to do what they wanted to do. And they're, yeah. they're getting put away. I mean, it's but the it's, pendulum swings, the pendulum swings. And I think people are becoming much more aware now of, of, of cases like mine who, you know, to, to draw attention to it. And the pendulum eventually swings. And how is that going to look in the future when there's no accountability? If once they start holding people accountable for lies and, and, and perjury and falsifying evidence and, you know, once their immunity is lifted, that will change things. The, you know, the Larry Nasser case is a perfect example. Larry Nasser abused hundreds of girls, and the FBI let it happen. Yep. And those girls had to testify in front of Congress and le relive their hell. And guess what? They sued the FBI for a billion dollars. Right? This after the FBI did nothing to help them. I don't know what happened, but I'm telling you right now, they whether they settled or what's going on, those poor girls have to live with that for the rest of their life that nobody protected them. And because the FBI failed, they failed to investigate and people were hurt. And God bless them for having the bravery to stand, sit in front of Congress and, and relive their hell to draw the light on, on this lack of, of, of people just looking the other way and not protecting those poor girls. Decency. So lack of decency, just, just totally. Well, it's all about, they, it was all about wanting to be promoted and, you know, it was all yeah. about their own kind of dr drive, you know, that's very dark. That's a very dark. And they were never charged. Those FBI agents were never charged or held accountable. The worst for what they thing did. I see right now, the thing that I'm, I, I the, the, the sword I would die on is the, the fact that the media doesn't report all of the news. They, Right. Pick choose what they want to report and they paint pictures for the public that are untrue or unclear or confusing or it's slanted yes. in one way or another to such a degree that it's dangerous for the country and big time and it's very i saw it in our own, i saw it in our own case i couldn't believe that they were sitting in the in the in the galley and I, what i was seeing i'm thinking oh well, great tomorrow it's going to be in the news it should be the cover of the new york times it should say x and then nothing but i'm writing a piece right now called is journalism dead or just in a politically induced coma okay i love that i'm writing i'm writing that right now and i'm writing it about my own experience about why i think that this has happened and how we got here and well, i feel it's going to be look up check the it CISA. out look up the cisa act it's cica um okay. we used to interfere with the government used to interfere on behalf of democracy in other countries elections so that they could keep people from ending up in communist countries it was a it was you know it was covert but it was the idea was to help the people not 
become victims of, of a dictator of a communist regime. Mm. And in 2014, they figured out um, that they could do that here. Mm. Well, I'm so, telling you, it's, they got rid I, of I, all the all the um, uh, antitrust laws were thrown out the window or not enforced, and big, huge companies were allowed to buy two or three different media in one city. Um, mm -hmm. Big, huge countries. When I was in college in journalism school. Um, the radio station couldn't own a television station that couldn't own a newspaper. You couldn't have two big um, outlets. Makes or, total sense. <laughs> now everybody owns everything else. You know, the same people own this. And, and it's, it's, uh, it does this, it's dangerous for society to not know the truth about things. And it's very dangerous. And, and, and when the government is helping people not know things, I mean, who would have thought that would have ever happened here? But I know how it happened. I mean, I saw it happen in real time in our my own case, in our own case, and I I was shocked at the journalists who were like, "Meh." I was like, "Wait a minute, you wrote this part, but you don't want to know the other part? Like, you don't want to know the why?" No, no, mm -mm. and I got I found out really fast how it all works, and I know how it got there. I know how they got to the place where they're not going to tell the full story. And I always say, I only talk about things, speak to things that I have lived experience on. And this is now part of my lived experience in the last three and a half years. So to the people who do tell the truth, God bless them. They're not afraid. You know, I am working with another woman whose husband was also falsely accused, who's who, our, our political views are very different, but that is the point is that we are the same. We are all human and right is wrong and wrong, right and wrong are, are clearly, you know, issues that we need to work on. Right versus wrong as opposed to Republican and Democrat. And that needs to be elevated to the top of the pile. So, but you know, what's going to happen is independent journalists are going to become the future of this country, right? They're, they're the ones that are going to be looked to as trusted sources of information, even though the government's trying to shut them down, like Mike Taibbi and the Twitter files and, you know, the government's trying to stop them and they're harassing them by having them IRS go after them. Like they're, but eventually the, they'll become louder than everybody else. I mean, they'll yeah, be the majority. It's going to have to be a lot of them. Gonna have to be a lot it, of them. It's, we're getting there. We're getting there. I've met a lot of them who are amazing people who are just trying to tell the truth. And despite being the pressure, right? You know, it's interesting and to me. There's like, no money. There's no money. There's no money. You're there's just no doing money. It so out they're of the all independent. Of your heart or your 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 commitment to the country, your commitment to truth. Um, well, isn't that great though? But I mean, remember back in the those those are the people who were the pioneers in our in our history, who were not afraid, who mm -hmm. who did it despite the threats, despite being called X, Y, and Z. There's there there's a growing number of people in that space who who are like, who wanted, who wanted to create change. And those are going to be a huge shift in, in journalism in the next couple of years. Watch, watch what happens. I'm, I'm money. Who knows? It's going to be a big entity. That's going to have to like, like an X, you know, Elon Musk can give them, you know, maybe more opportunities to, to have a platform where they can make some money doing it. But I hope um, so because I I don't think I, so. I don't think that it's serving anybody this way. And the people with no. the megaphones and the and the airwaves call people that want to prevent present a different point of view about just about everything, all kinds of names, and all, make all kinds of judgments about them. Um, yeah, without, look what happened to Catherine Herridge, who's the former CBS you know anchor best woman. journalist they, I can remember on television since like she's amazing. I mean, she's amazing. She's amazing. And she will, she will rise from this, right? She will prevail one of the most in the long run. People I've ever, I've ever seen on time. I agree. I agree. And that's why she will survive this, right? She will not only survive, she will thrive yeah. because she is her roots and her it's DNA is get, in the right place. It's hard to get beaten up though. Let me tell you, you know, oh, I know. don't have to tell me it's that. Hard. It's hard to get beat up and beat up and keep getting up. So yeah, but she will. I'll keep doing it and come back and tell me what's going on and whatever I can. Oh, such Anytime. a pleasure to talk to you. You know, and we can we can. Uh, there's more to come, definitely. Yeah, and then we need to write a comedy. 
Yes, let's laugh. <laughs> I, I know we can write a comedy about soap operas, as, as we say, turn the cameras around. That's the right. Comedy, the comedy was always happening right behind the camera. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> one of the funniest, yeah, like, of one of the funniest little things that ever happened. I was in bed with Ian Buchanan. <laughs> Ian, yeah, Ian. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and he took out, he took off his underwear and threw it to the camera. <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. Psh, I was like, what? You know, and it was yeah. just a joke. He had his pants on, but it was just so funny. We had so much. We, I mean, we had so much fun. It's like, it, I'm so glad we got to do it. Be on I the miss shows it. When they I were, miss like, it so fun. much. I really do. You miss your people. You know, we still, yeah. it's funny you get together and it's still like not a, not a day has passed and you can I still know, be right? your, yourselves with each other and not, you know, no drama about anything just laugh we laughed so much i mean we yeah. had such a great time very, we're very so lucky. we're so fortunate very very fortunate yeah. to have been around at that time so that's right uh, well there's so many more things i want to talk to you about but we'll talk about that next time because everybody wants good. to hear about your life on as the world turns and your yeah holden and all these things and elizabeth oh elizabeth, yeah working with elizabeth i mean oh. she's the best actress ever amazing um, yeah i'm really sorry that and you know what she said to her she said to me the last thing she said to me before she died, and I was with her yeah. right up to the end. Elizabeth Hubbard, she said, and I thanked her. You know, she was pioneer not just in television, but she was a she was pioneer with. He worked with the UN. She was worked with um, refugees. She was in Uganda. She yeah. was in Bosnia. She was in Russia. Um, she did a lot of philanthropy. She worked with prisoners. She taught prisoners how to with Shakespeare. She worked with puppies with prisoners. She oh was incredibly, gosh. she's an incredible woman. A lot of people don't know that about her. And, you know, I thanked her. I told her what was going on before she died. She was very concerned. Obviously she loves Mike and she loves me, obviously. Yeah. And I said to her, I said, thank you for everything that you've done for me. And she looked at me and she said, you can do more. Oh, I, I went, went, okay. So I take that as a, as a badge of honor that that woman said that I can do more than what she did when she was on this planet. And I, wow. I owe it to her to keep fighting because she was afraid of nothing. She was afraid of nothing. And I admire her for that, for her fearlessness and her strength. And um, I, if I can get an ounce of what she's had and to, and to continue with this, but she was funny. She goes, when I was going to court, she goes, what are you wearing? You know, she was always about like, what are you going to wear? You know, what are you putting out there? You know, like she would think about every single detail um you have your chanel about, suit do you have your chanel suit do you have your pearls do you have your chanel suit not, I mean, not anymore that. Yeah. <laughs> no I know. she said you know what she said you know what she said she said you're not an actress in this role you are a wife and a mother and she's right there's a difference there's a big difference so she than, didn't want than, you in a chanel suit she wanted you to look like no. a wife. she looked like me you know like who i am really oh, you wow. know yeah all the time and uh I remember yeah, that married this guy. You were one of the youngest actresses to get married. And then you married yeah. a policeman. And it was like, oh my God, it's so incredible. What you had such guts, I thought. And you've always thought you had that. I mean, that but I yeah. remember you're one of the first you guys have been married a long time. Yeah, 30 oh, years. 30 how years. How old were you? Like 20 something? 24. Yeah. 24. I, I you were really young. Yes. Yeah, but you know, I had been in the business for a long, both of us had had these incredible lives before we met. Like he had already seen the real dark side of life. He had, he had just lost his mother, his, his, his father and his sister just passed away. And I had been in, you know, I'd been a grown up for forever already. You know, I'd lived a life that most people had never lived at 24. You know, I, I lived on my own. I had had success, you know, so like, we were very young, but we were also very worldly and what well, we thought so anyway. <laughs> Little did we know that was coming. <laughs> but um we he's an amazing man and he's an amazing person and, and everybody's life that he touches has better for it. And uh we, we just gotta get him through this part. But and I we loved were. your your charity work that you did in New Jersey. Yeah, I did a lot of work for St. Jude Children's Hospital. I love that. It, That's my favorite. I give him everything. Yeah. I love that. They're they're what a wonderful organization to be a part of. You know, I've been part of it since I was a kid, since I was an Annie. I just want so, everybody to know you are a, you're a marvelous human being. And thank I you. Thank always you. Always admired you even before I met you. Oh, so, you too. I'm a fan. Thanks. You've you've always you've always been kind and you've always you've just been always a great person. And you know, we don't know each other 
that well as far as like our lives, but we, what we do in the same sense, right? Like, you know, when you've been in this business and, and the daytime world, you know, certain people stand out to you that have been kind and genuine and no ego. And, you know, you are one of those people. You've just always been a genuine person. So keep it up. All right. Don't we're ever change that, that comedy. I'm telling you, it's going to be I fun. Know. All right. <laughs> we're going to get through all this crap and it's going to be funny. Um, and say hello to your kids. Sounds like a plan. And, and I will. And tell them I'm going to keep I will. them prayers. All right. Thank you. We need it. So appreciate it. Thank you. Lots honey. of love. Thanks for being with us. Love you too.